So uh, it's a great pleasure. Welcome everyone to uh, also welcome our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Sue Hayden, who is known to many of you. Now, um, I made a big boo-boo uh, when I was uh, first notifying people about this. Uh, Sue is a member of the department of the uh, School of Pharmacy, not Pharmacology. That was my boo-boo. So School of <laughs> Pharmacy. And uh, so Sue is an historian, and I'm sure she'll tell us a wee bit more about. Uh, her uh, academic background as far as it relates to her talk, but uh, she teaches social aspects of medicine in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, her uh, master's thesis, I know, was related to uh, small hospitals in New Zealand. New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And her PhD was uh, kind of similarly related, but related also to Nepal, but I'm sure she'll tell us more about that. Anyway, great pleasure uh, to have Sue talking to us tonight about smallpox in the mountains, Nepal and New Zealand. So thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Well, I first came across the disease of um, smallpox in Nepal when I was researching my history of Kundi Hospital, which was the, the small hospital that Sir Edmund Hillary built near Mount Everest in 1966. And when he encountered an epidemic in the area in 1963, and then introducing um, vaccination, or um, he, he, re he began to he began to think that this was really an important reason behind his wanting to establish a small hospital in that area. So this epidemic that I'm going to talk about has um, very sort of strong links with the um, beginnings of Sir Ed's program uh, in the Himalayan region. Now, at that point, what I didn't know was that this em epidemic was part of um, Nepal's last major epidemic of smallpox. Vaccination against smallpox was the first national program to actually extend throughout the whole country. And when you see some of the challenges, that was a huge achievement. But there was also an assumption in the global program strategy for Nepal was that an epidemic in the mountains just wasn't going to happen. And again, I'll come back to that later. Now, smallpox was officially declared eradicated in 1980, the first and the only human disease to be eradicated. But that wasn't or hasn't been the end of the story. So what I would like to talk about today is the, the 1963 Everest area epide epidemic, smallpox in Nepal, and then Nepal and New Zealand in the global story. So let's start with the disease of smallpox. And this is a slide of a child in the Everest area in 1963. Smallpox was a disease that hadn't been seen in New Zealand for nearly 40 years, but was common in Nepal. So a little bit about the disease. It's an acute contagious disease caused by the variola virus um, a member of the orthopox virus family. Importantly, it's transmitted primarily through the infective drops during close contact of infected symptomatic people. And it's being, that's an important point because there's about a two week timeline between getting infected and starting to show symptoms. And that's a feature that's going to come out very clearly shortly when I talk about the epidemic in the Everest region. And so after about two weeks, often there's fever, lethargy, and then gradually a few days later, you get this rash, which then sort of spreads, sores in for, um, form inside the mouth and throat, nose. The pustules um, develop and expand and they may cover large areas of the skin and if you look at that slide there you can very much see I know it's a dark slide the houses were dark but those 
pustules that have covered so much of that child's face. Uh, eventually, scabs will form and they'll separate from the skin. Now, there's different types, two types. There's variola major, which has a high mortality. And that's the form of the virus that you find in Nepal and most of South uh, Asia. New Zealand, when it had it, was variola minor, which has much lower mortality. If people survive smallpox, then they gained immunity for long term, uh, varied. Most people will have varying degrees of scarring and some will have blindness. As well, no, there was no cure, but prevention through vaccination was well known. So let's just to set the scene, look at the Everest region. And as you can see, it's a spectacular, rugged, uh, re um, region. The, if I do this, will that sh does that, no, yeah. Everest is up there in, in the distance. So these are the villages, these are the homes to the Sherpa people who'd become an important part of climbing expeditions at this time. Now an environment like that's a challenge to providing any services. So if we look further here, this is just a map of that particular region. What you can see is uh, here Everest, it, Everest is just up there on the border, right on the border. And so this area is close to the Tibet Autonomous region of China. It's an area with no roads, you walk everywhere. And so what you do is in 63, the little airport at Lukla had not here had not been built. So you walk up this valley and then into the higher valleys and all the climbing expeditions walk on up towards Everest. Now at the time of the early six, it's an unstable political environment. You've got large numbers of Tibetan refugees coming in over the border, although many had gone by 1963. And in 1962, India and China were at war over border disputes. So let's look at the, the epidemic. Well, first of all, how do we actually know about it? Because one of the problems is there's very little known about um, many of these epidemics, so much of what has happened in, in Nepal. But uh, one of the things about Western climbing expeditions that people tended to write books about them. And so we have, we have Sered's account of his expedition, and there's a chapter on the epidemic. We have his diaries and uh, diaries of others. We have the American expeditions. They've got an account. We've also got oral histories of people um, from that time. So we can actually piece together quite a lot of information. So what happens is that a young Sherpa goes from his home village, goes down to the capital Kathmandu, looking for expedition work as a porter. And on the 20th of February, the um, American Mount Expedition, um, Everest Expedition, they set off. They, had, they collect all their porters to carry their um, supplies for the two week walk um, up into the Everest region. And so you can see that two week time frame is important. And you'll notice that when you look at the dates. 6th of March, smallpox is diagnosed. Uh, the Americans, they um, request vaccine be sent in because they don't, no, not, don't carry any. Um, they don't see any more cases. They do a bit of vaccination and then they go on to um, Everest. A few days later, on the 12th, Sered sets off from Kathmandu. And as he, um, he says, it's a two week sort of walk. And so roughly that two weeks, the expedition makes its, meets its first case of smallpox in the village of Surki, which is just near Lukla, where I said there was, a, where there is now a small airport. Now Surki is a long way still from anywhere. And so while they, um, they, uh, 
there's not much that they can do. They do have a vaccination set, but when they open it, they find it's broken. Um, that's what they had been supplied. So it's now nearly two days before they get up that valley and then um, before they can do anything um, about it. As they walk up, and it's this steep sided river valley, more and more cases they see and people are wanting vaccination. Finally, they climb up or it's a 600 meter, 600 meter walk up the hill to get to um, Namchi Bazaar, which is the small centre. And there the military check post has a radio and Sir Ed's able to request um, vaccine from Kathmandu, which is then flown in. Now what he does at this point is, is he abandons his plans and he vaccinates. Through late March, mid-April, as the epidemic spreads, he's providing vaccination throughout the different villages and lower down. And so in the end, the population of this area is about three and a half, four thousand. 4,000. Um, estimates he gives over 7,000 vaccinations, thinks about 25 deaths. Now, all this is going to be very, the deaths will be estimates because there's no means of recording you don't record births and deaths. Late May, when the American expedition um, returns, the epidemic is under control. And at that point, um, Sir Ed begins his um, other work that he had come for. This is part of the schoolhouse um, expedition. Now, what I've taken um, this from is from his report of the expedition and a picture of one of the doctors. Now, Sered's expedition had two doctors, Otago medical graduates, Dr. Philip Horton and Dr. Michael Gill. And this is Dr. Phil Horton um, vaccinating, about to vaccinate a child. So, the expedition now carries on building houses, building schools. It does do a bit of climbing. It puts in water supplies. Uh, another one the following year um, carries on with that work, does further um, vaccination um, as well. And then when Kundi Hospital is built in 1966, um, immunisation is really a very important activity of this small hospital's um, work. So what I want to do, I will come back to this a bit later, but I do want to talk now a bit about just smallpox and smallpox control. And I think as many of you will know, smallpox has a long history, going back thousands of years. Like most things, people do try and when they are unwell, they do try and do something about it. And there's evidence for um, for centuries that different have been tried to prevent smallpox from inhaling the powder from scabs to something that you may well have heard about what they call variolation which is when you inoculated uninfected people with the fluid from the pustle of people who had smallpox. Now when there was nothing else, yes there was the risk of smallpox but sometimes the odds were better of risking variolation um, even if you were going to get a form, um, some form of smallpox. And that practice spread through quite a large part of the world. Around the end of the 18th century, this is when the Jenner, um, Edward Jenner story comes in, and it's when he discovers that if you get infected with the mild of the cowpox, the vaccine, you, that gave you immunity against smallpox. And this was really development of um, what gets called vaccination. Uh, terms get used, there's a lot of slippage between what people will say, inoculation, vaccination, and it's awfully difficult to, from a lot of the records just working out what they are talking about. But this time vaccination is really what's, um, it's really vaccination with the vaccinia that they're talking about spread surprisingly quickly, reached India in 1802. So it's very quickly. The strategy is mass vaccination. You vaccinate everybody. 
And that's an important point that will come up again later. I've also put that last point because about non-acceptance of vaccination. It's not something recent. It has been really with the story of vaccination. It was there right from the beginning. And it's been different reasons in different countries among different groups of peoples. It's um, quite a complex uh, topic trying to relate what's going what's going on. Also by this time, by the time it spreads around the world, there's many versions of the vaccine. So the vaccine that you get in India will be totally different from what you end up getting in the US or, or Britain. So bringing it forward, so by the 20th century, we're still getting, so we've got the means to control virus at smallpox, but we're still getting millions of deaths worldwide. But by the middle of the century, it's not really a problem of what I call sort of the developed um, world. So for countries like Britain, or the, what you'll get is an outbreak, but it's maybe somebody who's travelled and from overseas. And remember, at this point, it's not now ships where you'd have time for the disease to emerge, developing air travel. And so people in both directions can spread smallpox that way. It becomes um, a target for eradication um, at the global level, uh, really from a proposal that's been discussed a bit earlier. Uh, but at this time, the WHO is more concerned with malaria eradication. And that's where huge amounts of money are being poured into. The, however, Russia, who's now back in the um, world WHO, um, or the calls for eradication and that to many countries surprise gets um, approved at the following year but although they at a global level it gets eradication getting rid of the disease completely um, is adopted it, it's supposed to be achieved through national programs there's very little um, money from uh, um, a global source. And that means that the countries like Nepal, who are poor, um, if they're going to deal with smallpox, they're going to have to pay for most of it themselves. And if you look at the statistics, that's what um, happens. So really, only small um, progress. They do make progress, but it's slow. Another point to remember um, at this time is by the early 60s, we're getting quite a lot of technological improvement. Importantly, if you're in a um, hot country, you're getting a heat stable vaccine, uh, which means that um, it's going to be effective. One of the problems is in the tropical climates, you can vaccinate with, uh, against smallpox, and then people say, well, why is it not working? The vaccine may be ineffective because of the, of the, um, the heat. Um, you're also getting the bifurcated needle, needle, which is far less traumatic than other versions. So when you hear people talking about the, the jabs of the lancets or some of these jet um, guns and things, which were really quite, for many people, quite terrifying, um, the bifurcated needle, which is sort of, those pricks are much less um, traumatic. So let's take that um, program, the global program, a bit further. So slow progress in the early 60s, but by 1966, uh, this is when it really becomes the intensified program. And this is when you start to get some global funding um, as well. Importantly, in terms of the politics, America buys into smallpox eradication. Malaria eradication isn't working so well. Uh, also, as part of this new intensified program is the strategy of surveillance and containment. That becomes the preferred strategy. And again, I'm going to come back to this, um, this, this point. And so the number of countries are decreasing. You've got areas, particularly South Asia, um, Africa, 
the, but the number of countries slowly dwindles. The last natural case is in Somalia in 1977. And then you have this very intense certification process, which leads to the official declaration in 1980 of eradication. Um, they had to show the world that it had been um, eradicated. So let's move on now from the general story to a little bit about smallpox and Nepal. And this is what I'm researching um, at the moment, uh, Nepal's story with smallpox. Now, if I want to look at the eradication program and see how and why it was successful, I really need to know a bit about smallpox and smallpox control beforehand. Now, the sources uh, are really scattered and fragmentary. And the official reports of what happened of the eradication program is, oh, well, it's not reported officially. This is all anecdotal. It doesn't really count. So I've set about trying to piece together what we do know and what we can find from all sorts of sources. Now, one of the most widely reported pieces of information was the death of the king from smallpox in 1816. But that's about all that gets recorded. Um, at that time, Nepal had been defeated militarily by Britain in the Anglo-Nepal War. Importantly, what happens is that you get a request from the Nepalese government to the British resident to introduce vaccination. A lot of the colonial history is about imposition by the colonial powers. In this case, Nepal wanted vaccination. They asked it from the British. And this independence in Nepalese thinking is something that keeps coming up in Nepal's history. The um, the British, they, they agree, they acknowledge the humanitarian motives, but they want to try and improve their relations with the Nepalese, and so they agree to it in terms of a political strategy. And because it's um, a political strategy, that's how it su survived in the British residents' letters, and that's how we know about it. Unfortunately, the king died before being vaccinated. Uh, that's just a picture of the British residency in Kathmandu. As you can see, it's a rather splendid um, building. It's surrounded by green. Um, I think there's a bit of artist license. But what's important was that that's outside the busy. Any of you who've been to Nepal will know the crowded streets of, of the Kathmandu. It's outside and it's deliberately so by the Nepalese because they want, to, the British resident is limited in what he can do. Nepal is um, often mistaken for being another one of the Indian states where they have British residents, and, but the British run. Nepal, they don't. They keep him under control. And, um, and as I say, that house very much um, illustrates that isolation that he's kept in. And there's a lot of frustration in the records about that. Now, that was um, 1816. Really, you've got to um, fast forward 150 years, because despite that introduction, then not much happened. And really, in people's lives, very little changed. In 1950, then, Nepal is one of the least developed countries in the world. We've seen that picture of this rugged, mountainous geography. There's huge river systems. It's got a rural, almost entirely rural population, very limited educational facilities. And note the literacy um, rate of about 2%. Uh, very limited health services, including vaccination. With Lack, limited education, you've got a lack of trained health workers, you've got pure, poor communication networks, hardly any roads. So that's a challenge to introduce anything, let alone um, just even if we're thinking about vaccination, but trying to introduce anything and get anything throughout the whole um, country. We also need to think about 
the complexity of cultural beliefs. Uh, this uh, temple is a small Hindu temple on the Buddhist temple complex at Swayambhunath in Kathmandu. It's um, a temple to, well, it varies as to, <coughs> as to what the name of the goddess is. For many in the Hindu, it will be Sitala, the smallpox goddess. But other groups, the um, population of the area, largely Newa here, will call her Harati or Ajima. Is she a goddess to be feared or to inspire devotion? A goddess who against vaccination or whose support can be enlisted. Now in the accounts about vaccination, a lot, culture is often portrayed negatively and as a hindrance to the global programs. Uh, this temple here, you can see today that um, smallpox has gone, but it is still an exceedingly popular uh, temple. And again, I'll talk a little bit more shortly. So we have a, sh a broad spectrum of beliefs surrounding the, the goddess. So moving now in Nepal from control to eradication, we get the uh, limited in the early 1960s, what we've got is very limited government vaccination. In 1962, we get a joint pilot project between the government and WHO, but that's only going to be in the Kathmandu Valley, the most populous area, but it is a very limited area of the country. Uh, that means um, there are opportunities for others. And when you look at the geography or the lack of limited communication, as you get developing um, visitors coming into Nepal, such as the climbing expeditions, they come into an area, they see an epidemic, um, they may decide to try and see if they can do some vaccinating. I've got an account elsewhere of one of the Peace Corps workers in another part trying to do vaccination, large numbers of vaccination in, again, in another part of this um, e epidemic. But it's all very ad hoc at this point. There just isn't the communication. The people are poor. There's, you don't have the batteries for the radios. You can't spread the news. You can't be informed of what's going on sort of elsewhere. It is an enormously challenging environment. Slowly more people do get vaccinated. And in 1967, uh, so that's just after the global program is getting going, you have this intensified program which further um, expands. But it is gradual expansion. And then it changes in 1971 when the team in Nepal decide on a new strategy. And there is some outside help, but this is very much a locally driven. They have new leadership, a new national head. They say, instead of just district by district, we're going to get it out to the whole country. We're going to do surveillance and containment, yes, but we're also going to continue with a form of mass vaccination, but in the winter months that suit and fit with what people are used to. So it's very much some local influences, quite a novel strategy that does get acknowledged by D.A. Henderson, the head of the global program, when Nepal gets written up. And he uses it in his own memoirs, Nepal as an example of something that worked surprisingly, surprisingly well. And I said I would come back to beliefs. And this was a strategy that they also adopted, enlisting the aid of the goddess. Uh, the... There, were, there was some opposition and there were some strong beliefs, but as Dr. Rita Harper said, and she in 1964 became the head of the newly formed Department of Women and Children's Health, and who I talked to when I was in Kathmandu recently, she said she saw the opposition, so she said we knew we had to work around people's beliefs. And so she said, I said, well, why don't you worship the, vac the goddess and then vaccinate? Which is the strategy that was um, employed. There wasn't, in just because you believed in the goddess didn't mean to say that you were necessarily against vaccination. 
There would be some who would, and in some places and in some countries it might be, but Nepal is a predominantly Hindu country and um, most of the Hindus got vaccinated. Uh, so it's a much more um, complicated sort of situation. The new technology by the late 60s was also really helpful. Um, talking to, as I call them, the grandmothers from the 60s, talking about their experiences with smallpox. They talked about the difference in methods and also very practical reasons about, well, we didn't get vaccinated because the, the vaccinators all came when we were out in the field or we were out at work. So there are lots of practical issues to get sorted out um, as well. And so I think given the challenges, it was an immense achievement that they did um, eradicate smallpox and that was um, acknowledged. And they eradicated smallpox before India. Uh, they had thought that get rid of smallpox from India because that a lot of the closest cases were going into Nepal from that way. But in fact, Nepal managed to get rid of them and get rid of it first. And so I now just want to come back to um, New Zealand and uh, Otago because um, although smallpox has been eradicated, it's not the end of the story. Now earlier this month, I was listening to the radio, and some of you might have heard it, when um, the int was talking um, about NASA, the US Space Agency, was advertising for a planetary protection officer. And this was a serious job advertisement. What their concern was, was they were wanted to, wanted somebody to um, look at how things might spread interplanetary. And this was both from uh, other worlds to here, but also from Earth, and that's a NASA poster there, to other planets. And the examples that the interviewer used was you know, to take, to stop, for example, plague, which we still have, and smallpox from getting to um, other, other environments. And so therefore, this is sort of part of the setting. What has happened with smallpox since 1980 is that although the, the disease, as people experience, has been eradicated, it's not, the virus is still there, it's kept in, um, supposedly just in the US and um, what is now Russia. And there's been this long debate in the Cold War politi politics, no one trusts each other. And in fact, not that long ago, some disused vials were found in another disused laboratory in the US. Um, so there's been this ongoing debate around what to do with those stocks and what happens um, if somebody else gets hold of it. Um, there has been auth WHO authorised research around the virus and improved vaccines, um, the genetic structure, the pathogenesis uh, and things. So ongoing work because the vaccine, although it worked, was not, um, was not perfect. There was room for um, improvement. But also this question of smallpox as a target for bioterrorism. And it's here that brings us into another Otago personality, Professor Cyril Dixon, who I think some of you will, um, will have known or will have worked with. So he was chair of preventive and social medicine here between 1959 and 1976. And so was here at the time of the 1963 um, epidemic in the Everest region. And um, Phil Horton um, says that uh, he, it, 
he was here, he'd already, it didn't affect his teaching and around the examination, but he does remember Professor Dixon um, giving a lecture on smallpox. And in fact, if you look at the teaching schedules, there is a separate, was a separate lecture for smallpox at that time. After 9-11 and the bombing of the Twin Towers in New York, fears in the US heightened that what if the virus got into the wrong hands? And if, and the, therefore the world could be at risk. But the trouble was at this time, no one had seen a case of smallpox for over 20 years. And many, for many people, a lot longer than that. Now in 1962, Cyril Dixon had published the book Smallpox here. And in fact, I have a I thought I yeah, I have a copy of it with me that is in our library. It's a fascinating, um, fascinating book. Now, it quickly became the standard reference textbook around the world at this time. You'll see articles written from the time. They all they will reference this, this book. It contains a wealth of information and much of it is very practical about what do you do if there is a smallpox epidemic, how do you look after patients. It contained many illustrations, so those pictures of what um, people needed. And as I say, this is the book and there's just pages and pages of illustrations. Now, What he says on page one, it hardly seems possible to understand the history and epidemiology of smallpox unless one fully appreciates the varied clinical manifestations. The gap, um, so that the history, epidemiology and methods of control can be examined more critically. And that's what he set out to do in the book. So the first part is all about the clinical aspects of smallpox. And so just as the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control um, and Prevention in the US, had used the book in the early 1960s, and they clearly did use it at the time, um, they now wanted it to be available in case, on the web, in case of a bioterrorist um, attack. And so the people now wanted to know what smallpox looked like. And this was one of the few books that had pictures from the developed world, um, as opposed to places like um, India. And so the university was contacted. And Professor Dixon, who now long retired, was happy to give permission. And so it is available on the web. And I'd like to thank Professor Sir David Skegg for his help with me on this. But there's more to Cyril Dixon's involvement in the smallpox story. And this is more a work, um, is a work in progress. Because part of the post-eradication story has been the writing of smallpox eradication history. Part of the recommendations of the 1979 Global Commission, and the full titles there, was that WHO should publish a comprehensive book about the eradication and that it should also maintain a, a very rich archive, which is what it has done. And this is the book, um, known sort of unofficial, or known most by the title, The Big Red Book, because as you can see from the, that information, that's very much what it is. It's, it's massive, and it's about, it, its focus is the eradication program. There's a lot about the history, there's a lot about the vaccine and all other aspects. So it's a wonderful resource, wonderful reservoir of, um, of material. However, Professor Dixon would have um, perhaps if you look up 
his name, there's the odd reference, but his contribution is a small photo and this small caption. He doesn't even get, they don't even get the date quite right because he actually finished in 1976, although it wasn't, um, uh, the new um, was 1977. But that's all they say about what he contributed. He, however, would have a very different view of it. And this is what he wrote in the report on the department of the time that he was here. And this is in the library here. What he says, his most important contribution to international um, the smallpox was providing, as he said, the basic methodology for eradication by case finding and limited ring vaccination. This, um, and as you, you remember, surveillance and containment, which is sort of essentially this, you identify and then you contain it, had been, it, it, in the um, most stories, it's linked to the work of CDC in West Africa. And when there was an epidemic, um, when there was war, they were short of vaccine, they wanted to get some vaccination done and so they adopted this strategy and this is really what then goes into all the manuals for the later global program but um, it, in fact so that there's no mention in those accounts of Cyril Dixon five years before that the big red book comes out Donald Hopkins who became deputy director of CDC um, and was a veteran of the smallpox campaign in his detailed history, says that, of course, Dixon had suggested such a strategy. Much more recently, and I mean just in the last sort of two or three years, researchers are now acknowledging that um, Cyril Dixon had contributed to the the, the strategy, because what he talks about in there is about the Leicester method, which goes back to the 19th century and um, in, in Britain. But then in, trip, in um, the Middle East in the 1949, an outbreak, he uses this method to contain um, a smallpox um, epidemic. Now, there are many aspects to this story, not least being personal characteristics. Uh, but I think that we can say that perhaps in the official history, and I think really the authors by the late 80, 1980s saw Cyril Dixon as rather old fashioned. But I do think that his contribution to the global story has been under acknowledged. Um, I think so now having gone from Otago to the mountains of the Himalaya and back again, I just now just want to finish off with returning to the 1963 epidemic um, back in um, the Everest area. And sort of why does it matter? It's just another epidemic, even if it's the last in another country. But as I say, it is part of Nepal's last major smallpox epidemic. It doesn't isn't get doesn't get mentioned in the the big red book which is the only widely available published source about smallpox in nepal and is really the general go-to book now for anything about smallpox what also um what the 63 epidemic shows is that the disease could spread quite easily to the mountains. In the changing environment in Kathmandu, in Nepal, developing tourism, and this is the height of cl the climbing sort of um, expeditions really getting under way, it could easily spread. The, the, the campaign strategy for Nepal, and as it writes at the beginning of the chapter on Nepal, was on the basis that Nepal was an epidemiological extension of India and that transmission would be difficult because of the terrain, rural population, and poor, poor communications. And there wasn't another major epidemic in the mountains, but 
There's a lot of concern by others in those mountain environments who looking at the way things could spread that it, that it could have been. Now, as, as I say, as time passes, what happens is people who write about smallpox, as I say, they go to that big official book, and why wouldn't you? It's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful resource. But they, you start losing the, some of the questions around, were they lucky? Some of the many challenges, the real problems around implementing that program. And it's quite as you do, you read and out of these, there's some very readable accounts of smallpox and things, but they're moving on to the bioterrorism and those issues. They're forgetting the public health program aspect of the smallpox eradication program. They'll bring it in, but not that much. And they won't, they don't, they're ignoring some of the sort of issues around that as a source because um, smallpox did have a lot of points in its favour in terms of as a disease to eradicate probably much more so than um, malaria. It did only have a human host, the vaccine was cheap, they had the technology. Um, so lots of things about how it um, could work. In producing that big book, they wanted um, to show that, look, this is how we did it. They wanted both to record it, so for history, but they wanted to use it as a way to show if people brought in other programs, look, this is how it worked. And so they wanted to be able to take lesson, the lessons learned and they wanted to be able to re reproduce it, adapt it to other programs, yes, and they, just as they had adapted the program in other countries. But I think my final thought is that if that wonderful resource is, however, incomplete and at times and maybe inaccurate at times, might those lessons be compromised? And so I would like to finish there, but with a picture, one of our favourite pictures from the Everest region of um, the mountain behind the little hospital at Kundi. Kumbila, which is home to the most sacred god of the region, and then the Chorten with the eyes of the Buddhist eyes watching out over the villages. Um, these are the important lingering um, images of the Everest region. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? Now, can we just um, take a, a moment, because we're recording this, so we need to make sure that you please give your question answer there. That's been fascinating. The account has been mainly in the Everest region, with the uh, association with uh, outside, uh, like the uh, climbers and so yes. forth. The rest of, of Nepal, um, how did they go with coordinating uh, the vaccination systems, like in remote places beyond Pokhara, up into uh, Gurung, uh, Gurkha regions, those places? Um, with, with, with difficulty, um, uh, what, um, what you, would happen is partly because it was so isolated and so remote that, first of all, there wasn't much vaccination um, initially and it was only um, so there were large areas that didn't get it and then it would be just on some trading tracks um, and things then as the pilot project um, expanded and expanded into other areas as they begin to get health posts in other areas they slowly begin to develop some communication, but it is exceedingly hard. The actual final eradication program was much more one of those vertical projects that was run from um, that was run from the the capital. Uh, 
and so very much vertical rather than integrating all health services. But the only way they could make it work was also to give considerable local authority to supervisors in terms of vaccinators and things so that they could respond locally to an outbreak and deal with it and then if necessary, bring, in, um, bring in people from Kathmandu. But um, you haven't got phones, you haven't got, um, as I say, very few access to radios, um, you haven't got the roads. In the end, WHO authorised a bit of helicopter support because that was the only way sometimes to get in to places. Um, I think this is why when you look at all this, because usually with Nepal we talk about why things didn't work. This is an extraordinary story of, of actually how it, of how it did work, but enormous um, challenges. Now I've actually got a question I want to ask you, because I think have, have you, from your question, I think, um, have you been into, you sound as if you've been there, have, I'm always very happy to talk to people who have at some point, been in Nepal at these different times, been with expeditions, travelled, had involvement with um, uh, the military, missions, whoever. So I'm always on the lookout for people. So um, oh, right. can you help me? Uh, probably to a limited extent. Thank I you. was there in 94 and again in 98, mm. uh, up the Kalikandaki to Muktanat and... Uh, saw Kundi Hospital ah, and uh, mm. went to Gokio and... We were there 96 there. to 98, so... <laughs> yes. yes. Mm. Mm. So I don't know if I can add much mm. to, to your talk. Most of what I know I've done from reading, like the delightful account or fascinating one by Mesha Smith. Yes. yes. Now, yes. he was the Peace Corps worker yes. who... Yes. Um, did a large amount of vaccination in 63, yes. um, and he's written an, an, an account um, for that, yes. It fitted nicely with what you were saying about the goddess of smallpox, mm. uh, with the reluctance at the waning of the moon for them mm. to accept vaccination. Had to be the new moon, I think, mm. didn't it? I think there's a lot of things, and I'm still sort of working through, through that and different groups of people as to who believed... Um, who believe what and, and, and the practices. So mm. depending on which group of people in which sort of area, there are elements, as you say, yes, amongst the, um, the moon. Other times it was certain days one, after infection, then you had to go to the goddess and do that, or you mm. had to give offerings at a certain time of day that were all part and parcel mm. of it. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Another question. I'm just going to comment. Yes. I think I happened to be back in Dunedin in 1961, and I certainly heard Professor Dixon oh, right. speak on his favourite topic. Yes. But I, as I was coming here tonight, I was trying to recall what item he had, he had preserved and he was very proud of, and I think it was related to Jenner or the early cowpox history, uh, and he had some sort of physical artefact that he had treasured and brought to New Zealand with him. Can you help me? I don't know. Dave, Dave probably can. Is David there? <laughs> David, yeah. Mm. What was yes, it? He was very disappointed because he, he had a, uh, a dry point etching of Jenner. I'm, I'm not sure whether you, this is what you're referring to, but when I arrived and took up the chair, he said, can you find that dry point etching that I had in my office of, of Jenner? And he suspected the GPs had stolen it. But um, I went round to the general practice department and looked in Barry Grimond's office and so on and never managed to find it. So um, it went missing. But I, I'm not aware of any other sort of more tangible. I've got some of his old books. Um, but, uh, yes, it's sad that he did, he did really sort of get written out of the history. Mm. Well, maybe he did. Mm. I don't know about that. Mm. His son Steve might know, but because there's a huge amount of material down that I haven't had a chance to look at in in the Hocken Library and what what's it's all catalogued, but um, I'd love to get to to have a look at some of those early <laughs> papers because he was, for example, with the first expert committee on smallpox, got included, and he was what they call the rapporteur, and so you can actually see you. It, you can get this sense of him in some of the 
the, the writing of that, and there are certain drafts uh, and things. So he played he played this part, and then he's uh, and then he's sort of it's it's written out. I thought I was going to have to show that actually he he uh, that maybe you know it's, uh, that he needed to be sort of acknowledged, but in fact other writers have now um, come. Have have started putting that story back in. So I think, it, in terms of that story, it, it is an at least at least it's an under acknowledgement of of that part that is um, that, that he did um, contribute. As I say, there are all sorts of other um, things. Um, well, it's probably easier for me to say. Yes. Cyril, <laughs> Cyril did tend to have a, a, a tendency to rub people up the wrong way, and he got invited. What I was told, he got invited to that first mm. quite important meeting in Geneva in the 1960s, mm. but they never invited him back. No. And so he, wa he was really excluded mm. from the subsequent discussions and planning. And mm. I think you know, people like Fenner, who edited the Big mm. Red Book, um, really didn't have a lot of time for him. So he, he, he really got a bit left out of the process mm. from then on. But it's interesting that you've sort of um, discerned that you know, he, he was he played quite a role in identifying mm. what turned out to be the, the, the crucial strategy, which was mm. not just trying to vaccinate everyone, but to detect cases and then vaccinate mm. a ring of people around them. Because mm. so. it's quite interesting, as I say, I do know that, because um, they say they talk about the CDC method and it's Bill Fahey in West Africa. I happened a few years ago to review his um, memoirs for a journal and he actually acknowledges in there that could he in the in the early got asked to go and see a case of smallpox in some country had never had no idea and so the head of the unit at that time and i can't remember if it was langmore or, so said oh this is the book you need so he he knew he knew about that he knew about um that book and apparently that rarely gets i have a colleague over in, in york and he, it rarely gets mentioned um, in uh, at the no, in the end. It's all it's very much it's the the influence of the CDC and the manuals and the personalities yeah. and everything. They they really um, it sort of take over um, what other people see as um, um, other people see as a, a global program. Um, much more than it's, um, it's not just an American program. Can I ask, yes. are there any religious objections because it's related to the holy cow? That I don't, I don't know anything around the cow um, because a lot, as you say, it, it does play a very important part and there is a festival around that. The, the material that I've read has really just related around the goddess Sitala. Have you read across anything related? No, uh, the gentleman behind had also... Uh, had only, only the goddess. Yes, yes. Because what I'm doing is really following up any leads that I come across and trying to see what I can find so that in the end I c can try and put together as much um, information um, as I as I can, um, so that it, and present it so that it's not dismissed as anecdote as some of the accounts. Now, the late uh, yes. Thank you very much for your um, for your lovely talk. Do you do you hope to contribute to updating the WHO smallpox book with your work? I don't think it would get to. <laughs> I don't think it would get. What I'm doing is that the aim is first of all is to do this and get it um, together and and publish and that hopefully in time it may be that in terms of people who write these stories will take into account what's been um, written if i can get enough material to put together say an article but it's really going to be how do i get some of that um, that material uh, presented so I've got to finish, um, I'm further ahead with some parts than others, uh, but if I can get sufficient material and have a firm enough case and be able to argue, argue it, 
um, you know, with, with, with evidence, then that would be my hope that I can get that into the international sort of literature. Another question? That's it, I think. Sue, thank you so much for uh, just a wonderful talk. And would everyone please join me in congratulating and thanking Sue. Thank you.